Okay, so continuing with our demonstration of vector spaces. Would we, would we get the same thing if we multiplied it four times? Um, I think multiplication isn't defined. Okay. That's my, that's what I think. Um, I don't think there's any notion of QQ times QQ. Nope. Um, or QQ times 4. Oh, actually, that makes the ideal generated by 4. So in the, the ring, so the rational numbers is a ring, and 4 is a number, and you can make the ideal generated by an element of the ring. And you get the principal ideal generated by 1. Um, I don't know, that QQ times QQ times QQ doesn't give you, say, Q cubed. Or maybe it should. It's, it's not defined at all, actually. I never really thought of, I don't think anyone's ever really suggested implementing that, but it is pretty natural that if you took a field times a field, you get the vector space, you know, dimension two. But um, that has not ever been, been suggested until right now. Um, I mean, there are, you guys are noticing things people haven't noticed before. Somebody noticed yesterday that i to the power of 0 0.5 is, um, I think, none which is obviously a horrendous bug, and apparently it's been in stage for maybe two years or something, so or one or two years. It's now fixed, in, or will be for the next version, but uh, somebody in this class, who is it, Andre, where are you at? Yeah, he noticed this bug, which no one had ever found before, so thank you. Um, okay, so back to our example, so you can ask for the dimension of a vector space. There are, of course, many methods on a vector space. If I were to do v.tab, you'd see a huge list, I'm not going to bother, um, but you can do that. Here's the basis. By default, the basis that it gives the um, gives k to the n is the standard basis, which you're used to. But you can make k to the n with a different basis if you want. Um, you can also ask for the span of some vectors. You can give them explicitly as vectors, or you can just give a list of lists, which might be a little easier to type in some cases if you're typing it in by hand. So this is the span over q of those two, of the vectors defined by these two things, whatever they happen to be. Of course, you could give a different um, field here if you wanted, such as the field of order 2. And you might get something different. It reduces all the numbers modulo 2. But I'll change this back to QQ. And also, it puts it in reduced row echelon form. So if we, um, so you'll find that fractions will occur sometimes because it's putting it in reduced row echelon form. So you have lots and lots of uh, ugly big numbers to the right if your space has large, is in a large dimensional space, but you have very few vectors. Um, you can also, given an explicit vector space, you can ask for the span of some vectors inside of that space. Um, I better change v to be q3 again. And so this gives us this subspace of um, v. And there is a there's a is subspace command. You can go w dot is subspace uh, v. So there you are. You could define several different subspaces of a common ambient vector space and ask if one is a subspace of the other as well. So that could be useful. I mean in three dimensions it's not so exciting but um, I'll make a one dimensional subspace v dot span of let's say um, 3, 3, 3. So, hmm, I wonder if that is a subspace of the space we just considered above. Um, oops, I have to give a list of lists. So w2 dot is subspace w. What do you think? Who says yes? He says, no way, I just made that up at random. Okay, well, let's see what happens. True, it's a subspace. I actually, I just subtracted the first vector from the second one. But if I did make it up at random, it would be very unlikely to be a subspace. Like if I put 13 there, now try it. No, it's not a subspace. Okay, so this is kind of nice because normally, <laughs> um, often, I don't know, if you've taken or taught linear algebra, you have questions like this. You know, you ask, is the space spanned by this vector and th this other space or whatever? And the way somebody might use a computer to answer them is they would um, 
rewrite the problem as a problem involving possibly solving a linear system or doing some matrix operations, and then they might type those into their calculator or do those by hand. With Sage, you could just describe the vector spaces as objects themselves and then ask the, the questions about them, which is very nice and natural. Um, and in, you know, if you've taken linear algebra and seen this, do you wish you had this facility when you were taking the class to say double check your answers? Raise your hand if you wished you had this when you took linear algebra. So I wish I had it when I took linear algebra. So it's nice because um, it's a little more conceptual. And it can get really confusing translating everything into matrices. Of course, behind the scenes, that's exactly what Sage is doing. But, um, but it's pretty clever about it. So here's an example, w.coordinates111. What about w2.coordinates? What should that do? What do you think it should do? What would you like it to do, rather? Because you don't really know what it's supposed to, what it's defined to do. But So... W2 is supposed to be the span of the vector 3, 3, 13. So it's all multiples of that vector. And I'm asking, how do, you, how do I write it in terms of the vector 1, 1, 1? How do I, sorry, how do I write 1, 1, 1 in terms of the vector 3, 3, 13? None. Exactly. It should go boom in some way, say no way. And it does, it says arithmetic error vector is not in free module. On the other hand, let's say I change this to 3, 3, 3. Like that. Oops, I forgot to change it. Three, three, three. Now, what do you what do you want that to output? What? Okay, yeah, one third. And uh, oh, yes. No, notice what it does. It takes the input vectors by default, and it puts them in reduced row echelon form. So it in fact doesn't give you back one third. And notice that when this thing printed out, it said it's the vector space of basis matrix one, one, one. So it doesn't matter what your list of vectors is, it takes them by default and puts them in reduced row echelon form, and that's what it's giving you the coordinates with respect to. You can construct a um, subspace with a specific basis, though. And that's what this span of basis command is about. So just following our example up here, if instead of just saying span, you say span of basis, then you get a vector space, and it has the basis that you asked for. Now what do you think this should output? Definitely one-third. The list with just the entry one-third in it. See if it actually does. Yes, it actually did. Okay. Um, for a moment, I thought the previous one was going to do one-third, because I was confused, so I was a little shocked. But it's just because it reduces the basis. Um, there's also a notion of vector in Sage. So, like if you do v or say w two dot basis, it gives you back a list of vectors, and um, you can also do w two dot coordinate vector, which can be really useful. Instead of all it does is instead of giving you back a list that gives you the coefficients of the linear combination of the basis that equals that vector, it gives you back a vector, so that if you took the basis matrix and multiplied it by that vector, then you would get your vector. Okay? So, I mean, you could, of course, just take that list right there and ask for a vector version of it, but it's nice to just have directly coordinate vector. Okay, so really what this is, of course, doing is it's solving a linear system. Um, this is really solving the linear system um, w2 dot basis matrix. Uh, I guess solve left. Yeah, solve underscore left. And then the vector is 1, 1, 1. So that's what's happening behind the scenes. But it's nice that you could just conceptually do things this way. Okay, moving on. So here's, a, here's our example that we had from before, except now, instead of taking those two vectors and just taking their span, which would have given something in reduced rational and form, we're preserving that we want our subspace to have that particular basis. Okay? And so there you are. And now when you ask questions, it's with respect to that basis. That's just a repeat of what we did before, but with a two-dimensional subspace instead of a one-dimensional subspace. Okay, so that's how you can make subspaces. Now let me just illustrate a few more ways of making a subspace from a matrix. So if you make a matrix, you can ask for its right kernel and its left kernel. And 
the right kernel, left kernel, actually doesn't really specify which one it is, because which is on the right, the vector or the matrix. But at least it allows there to be two different kernels without you having to always transpose the matrix. You really have to look at the documentation to know which one it is. Um, I'm just emphasizing this because you, know, you could consider the kernel to be this, well, the kernel could be the set of vectors so that A times, uh, the set of B such that A times B is equal to zero, or you could consider the kernel to be the B so that B times A is equal to zero. And uh, for example, in, um, I don't know, in the computer algebra systems from the northern hemisphere, usually this is the choice. And from the one in Australia, that's the choice. So it can get very confusing on the other side of, you know, because they're, you could just choose one or the other. It's kind of, there are natural reasons to make both choices. Depending on who you are, you'll be completely convinced that your choice is right and the other person's is wrong. So in Sage, we try to make it pretty um, consistently unspecified in that you have to be explicit. And if you look at the, um, actually, as an exercise, just let's just figure out which one it must be in these two cases, okay? So A is this four by three matrix. Right kernel is um, the entry, the basis for that are these two vectors. The basis is always the row vectors. So they have four entries in them. And so right kernel, the vector must be the one on the right. And you can check explicitly. Let's make sure that if you take one of these vectors and multiply that matrix in the right, you get zero. So you might want to just check one of those in your head. And then left kernel, well, the left kernel, well, there's only three of them, so that must be the vector being on the left, viewed as a row vector rather than a column vector. So the left and the right refer to the vector right here. So this is the left kernel. This is left, and this is right. But again, you um, look at the output or read the documentation, and it will be clear there. Uh, just don't assume that you should know which one it is based on the name. Just know that there's two choices. Yeah. No, just kernel. There is just kernel, because I decided on it being something, the left one, and um, implemented that. And then people later on said, what the heck are you doing? You can't, you can't do it like that. We're in North America. And, um, and so then they were really annoyed, and they wanted this instead. And then we decided on a reasonable compromise, having these both explicitly encouraging people to use these two, but leaving this so that a lot of code doesn't get broken. So that's the situation. There is dot kernel, and it's the left kernel. But again, I encourage you in your code to use explicitly left or right. Yes? Do you usually have dot kernel between left and right? Uh, what would that be called? Oh, dot kernel would return. Well, that would break all the old code that uses dot kernel as it is now, unfortunately. And usually, dot kernels. <laughs> Not a bad idea. You can have dot kernels. Yeah, that is. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, so you can compute the left and right kernels. Um, you can ask for the row space and the column space. So remember our matrix A is right here. And um, the row space and the column space are given. OK. So there they are. And the row space is the span of the rows. The column space is the span of the columns. But again, it's not like it suddenly transposes the basis matrix here. The first, the, these two vectors if you were to transpose them, would give you the um, same, would give you a basis for the column space. So you have to be a little careful about that. Um, vectors are usually thought of as row vectors almost everywhere in Sage. Um, I mean, that's one of the arguments for, so like when you make a vector, it's a, it prints as a row vector. And if you have a matrix and a vector, um, if it's a row vector, this doesn't make any sense, but this one does, which is one of the arguments for having this be the default. On the other hand, in every linear algebra book that you'll probably ever see at UW, at least this will be the default. So very confusing. It should always be, it should probably always be the, the left one though, because it's even easier to typeset a row vector, but I don't know, whatever. Um, just use dot left and dot right kernel. Okay, next let's look at some operations that we can do on vector spaces. So we'll just create two subspaces of three-dimensional of Q3. And um, just because before it was a good idea to actually print them so you can see what the actual basis matrix is and that it's not explicitly the one we gave. 
notice it's the first one is this, and the second one's that. They're both in reduced rational form. They are different, but there is something in common, actually. Okay, so it would be really nice if we could just look at a picture of these two vector spaces. And unfortunately, if you just do plot on a vector space, there are, you know, there are many vector spaces for which plot would be pretty meaningless. Uh, most vector spaces don't have dimension 3, but when you're you know, playing around or teaching, they do. So, um, and there are certainly applications for three-dimensional um, vector spaces. So um, it would be nice if there were a special case where if your vector space does have, is sitting inside of a three-dimensional vector space, it would actually plot it nicely. If it's, say, a two-dimensional space, it could plot a plane. If it were one-dimensional, it could make a line. But actually, it just says attribute or it's not defined. Basically, no, it's, nobody's implemented a plot method for vector spaces. Um, that said, I just wrote a little code that does it in a particular case. So um, all I did was I solved for z for a parameterization of my vector space and got two planes, one for each of the vector spaces, and here it is. And I'm not using tack, or jmol and rotating them around because suddenly it doesn't work for me today using this copy of Sage. And I, I think I now officially hate jmol, um, the 3D viewer, getting really annoyed by it. So wait, what do you do instead of... Oh, if you're annoyed by jmol, you can say viewer equals, and in quotes, tachyon. Um, this will use a ray tracer, which does not allow you, you can't rotate around or anything, but it will work on anything. It just generates on the back end a static PNG image using a ray tracer. Viewer equals tachyon. And um, one fun thing is it'll have nice shadows and you can do transparency and has reflections and stuff like that. Um, so you can actually do some pretty nice stuff. Um, there's another renderer besides Tachyon called Canvas 3D, I think. But it just gives you wireframes. So it's, at least you can rotate it around. This doesn't require Java or do any, involve Java at all. But um, it's annoying because it's wireframes. We are currently working on a version using the JavaScript library 3.js, which will um, look really awesome and not involve Java. So we'll see how that goes. Um, so I'm looking forward to that because Java is annoying. At least for, I mean, Java applets are annoying for doing 3D graphics because there's a lot of issues. I don't know if anyone's ever tried to use 3D graphics in Sage and had it not work for them. Has anyone here ever had that? Same here. It's really annoying. So <laughs> screw that. Okay, so, um, so we have our two vector spaces. And this one, it's kind of easy to see what the intersection probably is by just looking at them. But well, actually, li literally looking at the picture. Clearly, there's a one-dimensional intersection, like right down this middle. And um, if you just do w1.intersection w2, that gives you the intersection. So there you are. Um, so there's no like notation that you use to intersect them. You don't have to remember some funny character or anything like that. You just do dot intersection. And you can also add them up. And in this case, you get the entire vector space that we're working in. Um, you can ask uh, whether, say, the zeroth basis vector. So for these vector spaces, w, you have a vector space, dot zero gives you the zeroth basis vector, dot one gives you the first basis vector, or the one-th basis vector, and so on. So you can ask for some inclusion, and that one's not in there, um, etc. I guess I already showed you inclusion stuff. But basically, the upshot is intersection and sum were fine. And again, this would be you know a little more impressive and exciting if we're in a 10-dimensional vector space when we're doing this. Actually, just to, just in the interest of being impressive and exciting before we move on to modules, let's just try all this stuff but in a vector space of higher dimension. I'm going to say 50. So v dot, uh, I'll let a be a random matrix over the rational numbers with 10 rows and 50 columns. We can just print that out. Can't print it out. Um, a dot matrix. Oh, there's a command me. Matrix. Uh, what is it? Uh, no, no. I want to actually plot it because so it's, it's kind of big. You'll just see random numbers, but those are the entries color coded depending on how big they are. We think black being zero and white being the largest entry. So that's what our matrix looks like. So it goes over to the right a little. So it's a 10 by 50 matrix, and just. To see how random, in quotes, the entries are, there are the, um, 
there are the entries in the first row. Basically, all the entries are have numerator and denominator between minus 2 and 2. Uh, you can adjust that if you want. There's a parameter to specify. Basically, if you want, you can do whatever your base field is. You do qq.randomElement. Look at the documentation. Here it has num bound and denom bound. And what you do is you just, any no matter what the inputs are to random element there, you can just give them here. And they'll get passed on to that function. So now the entries will be uniformly distributed with numerator and denominator between minus 10 and 10. OK. And so there's our matrix. And now, how do we get a vector space from this matrix sitting inside of a 50-dimensional vector space? What should I do? Or give me, give me an option. There's lots of options. OK, I can take the right kernel. So let's just do that. Um, w equals a dot right kernel. So this matrix has 10 rows and 50 columns. And the right kernel is going to be a whole bunch of vectors with 50 entries that when you dot them with this matrix, you get um, 0. And there we are. And in 0 0.09 seconds, it computed that. And now we have this big vector space. And it says vector space of degree 50. The degree is the dimension of the ambient space in which it's sitting and dimension 40. So this, is a, this kernel is a 40-dimensional subspace of a 50-dimensional vector space. And um, it doesn't print out the entire basis matrix because it's pretty big, 40 by 50. Um, if you want it, you can, I mean, we could kind of look at the basis matrix by doing w.basismatrix. And again, we can use the matrix plot command as we did above. And here you can see that it looks, that's what a matrix in reduced rational form looks like when you plot it. Um, you have some crazy entries off to the right. You have a diagonal of ones and then zeros everywhere else. But remember, the way the color coding scheme works is um, since there's negative values, those will end up, I think, getting mapped to zero. So it's kind of funny. That's why the zeros here aren't white, which may be confusing. Um, OK, so that's what the basis matrix looks like. You can look at one of the basis vectors by doing, say, w.0. OK, so this is what a typical basis vector looks like. It's a bunch of zeros, and then there'll be a one, a bunch of zeros, and then this. So notice, though, by the way, I mean, you can do all these operations, work with vector spaces in a space of dimension 50, and it's, point, it's like a tenth of a second to do almost any operation you want to do. Um, one of the things that Sage has is a lot of support for asymptotically fast exact linear algebra. So if you're uh, trying to solve a system, you know, it's like 300 by 300 matrix times x equals v over the rational numbers, and your answer is going to have like hundreds of digits per entry, but it, it can do that in a matter of seconds using very clever p-adic techniques. So um, Sage is good at that sort of thing. Um, much better than most other programs, actually. Uh, OK, so we have our subspace. Let's see. Any, any ideas for what to do with it? We could do something like we can make another subspace of dimension 40 and compute the intersection of those two. How's that? So let's see. How about if I? Um, I'll just make another random matrix, which I'll call B. And I'll let W2 be B.WriteKernel. And now let's take W.Intersection, W2. What do you think the dimension of the intersection is going to be? So see how now there's a theorem in a linear algebra class you would give, which would um, give you some bound related to this dimension, maybe suggestive of what the dimension might be. And given that they're random, you could probably figure out what it would be. You don't know for sure. I mean, the dimension could be 40 again if, if this other, um, I mean, if you're all, all you know, W2 has, let's see, W2 probably has dimension 40, but it could have, I mean, it could have been B is the zero matrix, so it could have dimension 50. So you don't know for sure, but um, you could probably guess what the dimension is. Does anybody have a guess? 30? OK. Anyone else? 17? No. OK, let's, let's try and see what happens. Um, hmm, that's a harder calculation. This, that took a while. I'm curious how long. An enormous amount of time, like two seconds. Uh, 1.6 seconds. And it turns out, indeed, it has dimension 30. Again, it didn't have to have dimension 30. It could have been a little bit bigger. 
but it does have dimension 30 because things are random. So good job. Um, and we could look at it. Uh, I'm kind of scared to look at it, but let's look at the first basis vector. Uh, actually, dot zero. I have no idea how terrifying this will be. But, oh, it's not, <laughs> not too bad. I wouldn't want to compute that by hand. But um, So yeah, that's what the entries look like in the spaces for the intersection. OK. All right, next, uh, let's see how we're doing on time. 10 minutes. OK, now we're going to talk about almost exactly the same thing. But um, instead of talking about vector spaces, We'll talk about modules, and I'll also talk about how to make um, homomorphisms between vector spaces from matrices. And um, in the context of modules, that, that'll, that gives you access to some extra functionality. So for everything I'm saying for the next 10 minutes, um, if you don't know what I'm talking about, especially if you're an undergrad, don't worry about it at all. Okay? Try to follow along. Basically, just think, hey, you could do everything in linear algebra, but with the field replaced by a ring, which would make sense if you knew what a ring was which um, you do because I told you last time, but basically, <laughs> instead of using the rational numbers, you could use the integers. And you would never, you're never allowed to divide. You, um, you try to do echelon form, but you're not allowed to divide. So you'd come up with something kind of like echelon form called Hermite normal form, which presumably Hermite came up with. Um, I don't know. Um, okay, so you can make a module. Um, so you can work with modules over PIDs in Sage. It would be really nice if you could work with modules over more general rings um, <coughs> that are not principal ideal domains. But unfortunately, that's not implemented uh, in Sage. Magma has some pretty good support for that, but Sage doesn't yet. Um, you can, except in the context of multivariate polynomial rings and um, Grobner bases, then there is some functionality for, there's actually some serious functionality. but. Um, for this general module theory stuff, your base ring has to be a PID. Because that gives you an analog of echelon form and so on. Whereas if it's not a PID, then you don't even have a good analog of echelon form. Um, but that would be good. So you can only do that. And some functionality is actually only for modules over Z. Um, there's some really nice functionality for like co-kernels of morphisms and, or images of morphisms. And you can make these, uh, and you can compute co-kernels and so on, but only over Z. OK, so let me show you some examples. I'll make a random matrix over the integers. And you can ask for something called the called end of it, which is the endomorphisms of this rank 4 z module of z to the 4. Um, it, just says, it just considers that as a set, but at least it calls it a set here. But of course, you know it has more structure than that. And you can coerce, let's just call this thing r. Um, you can coerce a matrix into that, and that makes an endomorphism. In this case, I guess it's just a, well, it's an endomorphism because the domain and codomain are the same. So um, this matrix defines a homomorphism from z to the 4 to z to the 4. And now you can do some things with it that wouldn't be available just on a matrix. So a matrix, you can ask for the kernel, um, but with a, a morphism, you can also ask for the image which just doesn't define a matrices for some dumb reason. Um, let's see, let me show you, uh, just to guess what the structure of the image will be like, you can see first the determinant is non-zero, so this is going to be an injective homomorphism. The matrix will define an injective homomorphism, it'll have zero kernel. Actually, you just saw that. But it needn't be surjective, because we're working over the integers rather than the rational numbers. So the image may not equal the entire uh, z to the 4. And in fact, here's what the image is. It's the free module, but with this basis. So if you take all, you know, linear combinations of the rows of that, or I guess, yeah, the rows of the matrix that we started with, this is the module that you get. Okay, so it's computing the image of uh, homomorphism. And now you can compute the co-kernel. Unfortunately, there's no command phi.co-kernel, but you can um, create the, you can ask for the codomain, which is just z to the 4, and you can quotient out by the image. And then the quotient will be some finite abelian group. And you can compute with that directly. I have to shrink this if you want to see the invariance, though. So this is um, this C is the finite abelian group, which is z to the 4 by the image of that matrix. And it's isomorphic to z mod 2z cross z mod 90z. 
And you can ask for generators. The generators will just look like this. They're really simple. But for each one, you can lift it to a representative in z to the 4 for that element of the quotient. So that's what's going on here. Um, when you explicitly work in C, it's just some abstract object, which is basically just z mod 2z cross z mod 90z. But you can lift each of the vectors. And that gives you things back in z to the 4. Um, you can also ask for the span of the rows. And notice that this is over the integers. When you ask for the row module of a matrix over the integers, it comes back as a module over the integers um, by default. Row module, you can also explicitly give it a ring, I think. And then it gives you something over that ring. Um, if you're ever teaching linear algebra, and you want to, or if you're ever taking it and you want to be really confused, notice that if you do, this is unfortunate, you say, I'd like the 2 by 4 matrix with those entries, and I want the row module. Um, for some reason, you stumble upon using row module, and you've never heard of modules or anything. You might be really confused by this, because you think, oh, no, echelon form is wrong, um, because you sort of expect something over the rationals. So um, some people want to make it so that the default, when you make a matrix, isn't the smallest ring that contains all the coefficients, but the smallest field that does. Um, so maybe that will change. I don't know. Okay, you can do inclusion. Basically, you can do all the things that you could do before. Um, you can also do this over a polynomial ring in one variable, over a field, which is another example of a PID. So here is a 3x3 three three matrix with these entries over the polynomial ring Q adjoin X. And I can ask for the row module, and it gives me back a basis. But notice that it um, this is not reduced row echelon form. This is only Hermite normal form. Because, for example... Um, notice right there, you have a leading coefficient, and it's not 1. If this were, if you're allowed to divide, you would just clear that out completely. You're not allowed to divide except by rational numbers. And so that's this bottom row. Um, you can make homomorphisms uh, between modules over Q adjoin X. You can ask for the kernel. Um, unfortunately, computing quotients, so I think you can compute the, see if you can compute the image. I think this is harder and, oh, that's, that's implemented. So you can compute the image. But you can't compute quotients yet. Um, I think the code is mostly written, but I think there were some subtle cases that it didn't really correctly cover, so we just turned it off. Um, so you can't do quotients of arbitrary free modules over arbitrary PIDs, even though the algorithmic theory needed to do that isn't really that hard compared to what we've already implemented. Um, but all the other operations that you saw, like intersections of modules over Z, etc., that's all supported. Also, one thing which I didn't illustrate in here is um, you can take, and I find this very useful for a lot of what I do, you can make um, like a, a vector space over the rationals, and then you can do span um, over z of, and then you can give some vectors, like one, two-thirds. They don't have to even have integer. Basically, you can make a z module that's embedded in any way you want inside of q to the n. Uh, whoops. Uh, is it? What did I do? Maybe I have to put it second. Or maybe it's is these. Yeah, there it is. Okay. So notice what happened here. What it what it's done is it's made the submodule of q to the three spanned by these vectors over z. So it's all the integer linear combinations of these two vectors. And um, you can do that. You can have several different such Z submodules of a Q vector space, and you can ask for intersections of those submodules, inclusion of one and the other, et cetera, et cetera. Um, which is really useful if you're really into working with, um, I don't know, abelian varieties given explicitly by homology groups and stuff like that. OK, so um, that's modules over Z. Looks like we have two minutes left, and all I'll do in my remaining two minutes is tell you that next time we're going to talk about NumPy in more detail. I've mentioned NumPy several times, but I'll more systematically tell you about um, how to use that for linear algebra types and matrix algebra type stuff. Okay, so NumPy is this numerical um, system. All right, so good luck on the midterm, and I'll see everybody on Thursday or Friday, you know, whether or not you come to my office hours.